Hello everyone, welcome to episode 45 of the Photoshop show. Okay, if I could get down on my hands and knees and start doing like this thing, I would be doing it right now. Because tonight we are bringing you my hero. That's just, you may call me a geek for this, but this guy is my hero and that is Peter Crow. Peter Crow is a photographer, he's an instructor, but why he makes me, why he's my hero is because he's the author of a book called The Dam Book. Dam stands for Digital Asset Management. And he is the groundbreaking guy in the field of how to organize and manage your photos, particularly in Lightroom, but not just in Lightroom, you know, kind of across the board in the world of digital photography. So we're so excited to have Peter here with us tonight. Peter, can you say hi to everybody? I sure can. Very happy to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Um, you know, I always tell everyone that I mess up their bios. So, Peter, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, so, I'm a photographer, and that's what I've done for 30, well, about 30 years. And about 10 years ago, a little, little more than, or a little under 10 years ago, I wrote a book on how to build and manage digital photo collections. And that has, uh, has taken me has added to my career as a photographer to, to now become a teacher and, a, and writer and, and lecturer. Uh, the work that I do in photography is uh, mostly corporate communications and advertising, mostly people on location, and uh, at, I've also uh, recently published a couple of new books, uh, brand new multimedia books that are aimed at a very broad audience. Uh, in, and they tell you how to manage your photos, how to organize them and, and make sure you keep them and, and really get the best out of them. And, and we'll be talking about that today. Well, that's terrific, and we're so looking forward to it. Absolutely. And we have um, an amazing group of panelists down here who are all ready to just bombard you with questions. Among them is Erica Thornis. Say hi, Erica. Hi, guys. I am so excited. I've been looking forward to this show. So <laughs> I can't wait to hear more and learn more. Well, you shoot a lot, right, Erica? So you have a lot of photos to deal with. Yeah, we're, yeah, way too much. <laughs> so, Peter, if you don't know, Erica specializes in shooting underwater phot photography, among other things. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, underwater and beach out of San Diego. <laughs> that sounds pretty good right now. It's pretty cold out here in D.C. Now, Erica, didn't oh, I see you on um, somewhere at Google? Yes, I was just at the um, Google Plus had a, a wonderful show um, called, I think it was Intimate Moments, and um, they were using it to advertise some of the new photography and video um, effects and different things that they're using for Google Plus for image storage and production of images, and they had a bunch of us come up with our um, favorite Intimate Moments photos. and. Um, I had three images in the show, and they are just being delivered. So the first one's up on the wall, and I've got two more coming tomorrow. So I'm stoked. And yours was wasn't yours the headline photo? Yeah, I was being I was being modest, but yes, mine was the headline photo on the cover, and the image made it into the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. So that was pretty impressive. That is amazing. I am so excited, and you really deserve it. I mean, you Thanks. know we're a total fan of your photographs. That's <laughs> yeah, really I'm, cool. I'm getting red cheeks here, but yeah, it was it was uh, a huge highlight in my photography career so far. Well, I'm sure it's not the going to be the highlight for long. I think you're going places. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have someone who's going places, sort of on the other side of you, and that's Sean Duggan. Hi, Sean. Hey, Jan. Hey, everybody. Nice You've already you. gone places, I should say. I apologize. <laughs> You are a, a major... Always trying to go places. <laughs> yes, you are. Tell us what you're doing these days, Sean. Well, uh, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a, uh, a welcome breather coming up. Uh, I just finished recording a class for lynda.com last week down at their headquarters in Southern California. So I can't say too much about that at this point other than it's a Photoshop class, but I'm really excited about it, and uh, I'll be letting you know more about that uh, in the near future. So I'm um, oh, having a break really from that. Fun. That's so great. Was it fun? It was great. Yeah, it was, it was really cool, and uh, I'm really excited about all the stuff that I developed for it. And you know, of course, it uh, generated a wealth of new ideas, sort of along that similar topic. And I'm looking forward to going in and, and working with some of those new ideas. And, and other than that, I'm also just sort of coming to the end of uh, the fall semester at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, where I'm teaching 
uh, digital capture and workflow in their online program. Ooh, that's exciting. I did not know that. Well, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got, you can bring all of your students' questions to um <laughs> Well, this is great to be here with Peter because uh, I've learned so much from, from Peter. I first met him uh, several years back, and um, I just have, you know, a, a lot of my organizational uh, structure and stuff that I use is, is sort of, I was inspired by stuff I learned from him. I kind of uh, grafted it onto stuff I was already doing that made sense for my particular situation, uh, but he's uh, a, a real um, knowledgeable person in this field and I would definitely recommend people to pay attention to what he says because it's all good advice. Got to agree with you. Absolutely true. Well, great. Nice to have you, Sean. Thanks for Thanks. being with us. And next to you we have our wonderful Ron Clifford, the co-host of the show. Hi, Ron. Hi. How are you doing, Jan? Great. It's good to be here again tonight. And um, yeah, we never got a chance. I guess you weren't here on the last show, Erica, because I was really itching to kind of boast about you down at the Google. Uh, thing there and seeing your picture and if I if I'm correct I've been seeing some people receiving these as big metal prints they've shipped them out to you guys right yes I've got one on the wall it's a um, the one I've received is four feet across and it's my superhero on the beach in the black and white the one that was a Google featured image so I think it's got 18 million views right now so um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's pretty cool. It's it's big, giant on my living room wall, and I'm excited to receive my six foot one to go on my dining room wall tomorrow. In time for Thanksgiving. Wow, that's just really, really exciting. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, it was so kind of Google to send them to us, and the metal just really makes the images shine. So I've really learned now to print big or go home. Like printing right. big just makes a difference. Yeah. And I just want to say that th this particular show I'm most looking forward to because um, everybody, I guess, changes their workflow as time goes on. I was talking to someone just today, and we were having coffee, and he's a photographer, and he had mentioned to me, he said, yeah, my workflow, he said, I kind of have everything from like 2005 back all glumped together because I didn't know what I was doing, and now I've got it more organized from 2005 forward, but even for myself, it's constantly morphing into what would be a better system for me. I know that there's not one perfect system, and I'm sure, Peter, you're going to mention that, but there's certain fundamentals that I, I sure could use to keep me on track as my system morphs over here for my particular use. Dave, how are you? Doing great. That's um, good. It's great to be back again. I had to miss last week's show because we had... Uh, well, we were doing photo shoots here at our, our very own castle in the Napa Valley. Um, if you have not been to Castello di Armorosa, you need to come and visit. Um, it's just a, a wonderful place to just so many great things to shoot on their own, as well as a great great setting for for shooting for shooting people for uh, portraiture. And, and what, uh, were you shooting with Karen Hutton? With Karen Hutton and uh, Annette Biggers were, were here, and just. Uh, and they brought up uh, an actress from uh, Los Angeles, Jennifer Freeman, and uh, spent a couple days um, shooting in and around the castle. And, yeah, awesome time. Well, everybody's doing such exciting things. Isn't it great? And, you know, so much of that is because of Google Plus and just meeting each other here. You, Peter, I'm so glad that you're now going to become a big Google, Pl Google Pluser when you hear these stories, aren't you? I mean, it's just incredible. This community is really tight, you know, and helps yeah. each other. It's neat. It's neat. Um, so usually at the beginning of our show, I do a quick uh, um, tutorial, and I do have something for you tonight. But first, I want to show you something, and that is, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but this is the first time this is live. I am now live with my very own Google Helpout. So I wanted to show it to you so you know how to get there in case you're inclined to participate. I think it's a great idea whether you come to my help out or those, you know, other people have help outs there too. I think, Ron, you're going to have one soon, aren't you? Yeah, they are, they're all live now. I just haven't made a post about it. I'm just getting that prepared. But even though I haven't put it live, it was scheduled, so I actually had my first one today. Um, oh, you did? It was really exciting. Yeah, it was really exciting. So I, was, I wasn't ready for it. I had put that I was available from because I was home today certain time and then all of a sudden I get this notification somebody wants one now <gasps> and I thought, oh my goodness I'm not ready I <laughs> but you're always ready you know your stuff yeah yeah well let's take a look at that and see if I can show you what that looks like can you see my screen now with the help out yeah I see it now so in case those of you who 
aren't aware about what helpouts are. They're similar to hangouts, but um, they let people, not everybody, but people who can kind of weasel their way in there, <laughs> um, can give a kind of like tutoring to other people through a hangout-like session. Would you say that's a good way to describe it, Ron? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent way to describe it, Jen. It is. It's a hangout. There's a couple more features. There's, you know, uh, a kind of a business layer over it. But it is basically what we're doing now, one on one. Um, and I think it's a great platform for for teaching. Well, you know, I've I've been doing that for over two years now here. So. Yes, you have. So I'm going to see if I can find yours in a minute. But first, so I'll plug mine, which I named the Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop Hotline. Um, and the idea here is that you can just click on this, and then uh, if it says up here that I'm available, then you can um, just come and you know start talking to me and ask me your questions. And sometimes I'm available just on the spot. Other times, if you if it says I'm not available, you can. Uh, come down and look at the schedule and it'll say some available times. And I think, Ron, you're doing something similar. So let me see. How can I find yours? Is, would yours be under Photoshop? Uh, you'd probably just be able to type my name and find it. Let's see. We're going to type Ron Clifford. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Ron Clifford. <laughs> How my photography is stuck and and it can't get up. That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I figured it, you know, go catchy, right? <laughs> That's okay. And yours is free. Holy cow! I'm gonna say only, it. only the first one's free, and only for the first five people. Aha! Uh -huh. So maybe I should take your hint and make some free ones to start with. That well, there's a, there's two in my mind. There's two things about that. One is. Um, I would like to get a few ratings for people before they decide, you know, and, and free is not a bad way to do that. As well as it gives me a chance to work out some kinks before I officially charge for it. But there are two others there that I am charging for completely. So. Ah, okay. Well, you guys, you know, everybody, our friends out um, in Google Plus land, we would really appreciate it if you would help us to get started with this. Um, it's either free or just, you know, minimal charge and so other people are doing it for a lot of money. So <laughs> you can get a great deal either learning about photography from Ron or I can help you with anything you want to know about Photoshop and Lightroom. And if I don't know the answer, you know, I will get back to you with the answer. So please help us with the help outs. I think it's a great thing. So that's one thing I wanted to show you. And yeah, then... Screen share. You're still screen sharing. So. I know. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> now, I'm <screen> oh, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm screen sharing Lightroom because um, I was teaching a live Lightroom class this week and that's always a good way to find out what things are screwing people up. Um, and I found out, and this totally makes sense, somebody asked me this question. They said, well, I would like to change the order of the photos as they appear in the grid in my library. But look, for example, if I click on this photo down here at the bottom of the poppies, that I took in France and say I want that to be the first photo in my grid and I try to drag it up there, I can't. It won't go and I get this message. What the heck does this mean? Custom order is not supported on a folder that contains subfolders. Oh my goodness. So this is the problem and I want to show you what it means and then show you a way what I would do if I were in that situation. So if you take a look over in the folders panel, I hope you can read it. You never know if the type is too tiny or not. Um, but you may see that I've now selected a folder called 2012 France. And inside of that folder, I've got a bunch of subfolders, like um, some photos I took in a place called Roussillon, and another subfolder of those taken in Gigantes and those taken in Nice. So what happens is when I've clicked on a folder that contains subfolders, like my 2012 France folder, then I get in that situation where I can't just grab a photo in the grid and move it around. Which sometimes, you know, I like to do that like if I'm going to create a project like a book or a calendar and I just want to test out some sequencing. So what can you do in that situation? Well, one thing you can do is um, you could always right click on a, fold on a photo and find out which subfolder it's in and then just sort of click on that subfolder and then you can move photos around as you wish by just clicking right on the thumbnails and dragging. But if you wanted to be sequencing in the parent folder, the one where you can't move individual photos, this is what I would do. And Peter, if you've got another idea, I would love to know it, because I'm just making this up. Okay. But it seems <laughs> what I would do in this case is I would select everything, Command A or Control A on the PC, and then I would go and make a collection by clicking the plus symbol on the collections panel. Yeah? That's what we're going to talk about today, a lot. Hey. <laughs> oh, good. 
All right, well, so here's my 2012 Krantz collection, and it's going to have in it all of the same photos that are in that folder. Now, of course, a collection doesn't move any photos around. It's just um, a, a, like a virtual grouping that points to the photos where they actually live. They're still in their folders on the hard drive where I always keep them. But now that I'm working with a collection of those photos, I then can take any single photo and drag it around and sequence it where I want it. Cool? Very cool. Yeah, Useful. awesome. That works. And then I get rid of my collections, because I don't know about you, but I tend to have way too many. So I just select it when I'm done with it and click the minus symbol and goodbye. Yeah. So that was my little tip of the day. And every time I teach, I find more things like that, because, um, you know, it's a complicated program, I think. Yep. There are lots of little details. Yep. So I am now done, and I would love to turn over the floor to Peter Crow, who okay. is just, just wow us with something great. Okay. So <laughs> well, let's talk about that very thing you've been talking about, which is how do you organize your stuff. I'm going to uh, turn on screen share here and switch over into Lightroom. And you guys hearing me okay? Yes, we are. Okay, beautiful. Um, all right. So, so let's talk a little bit about organizing. And I'm going to start with a little quandary here. Like, what do you do with the big mess? And which of the tools do you use to organize with? You can see here, I, I've got a catalog that has 75,000 pictures in it. So a fair number of pictures. And that could be a pretty big mess. And Lightroom offers you a bunch of different tools. Right, so we have keywords, and then there's folders, and of course you could definitely organize with folders, and then there's collections, and you know which of these things should you use and why? That I think is one of the biggest questions people have, and so what I've done is laid out some principles that show why I think you should use each of these tools for a particular task. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to start with a little diagram that's going to help you understand this. And sorry to, sorry to move out of Lightroom, but I think this, is, this really helps to understand it. Um, so I'm going to go through this. It'll take just a couple of, it'll take a minute or two. And, and I want to start by dividing organization up into three layers. And we have three different parts, the storage of the files, the tagging of the files to put tags on them about that describe the pictures, and then the projects that we make. I feel like I'm talking into an empty microphone. You guys are all still there, right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, good. All right. <laughs> so let's talk about storage for a minute. Um, there's the storage, the different parts of storage are, are these several different things that, you know, the devices, is it the, the hard drive that you keep it on, and then the folders that you use on the drive, and the names you have, and how you back it up, and what format you store it in. And those things, I think, ought to all be really standardized, and they shouldn't be used so much to tell you about the pictures as to put the pictures away and preserve them. I say stack it up and back it up. You know, can we put the pictures into a structure where we just have the same kind of regularized structure so that we know that where to put them when we download and we can back them up and preserve them and restore from backup in the event of a problem. So we really don't want to try and do too much with storage. Um, in terms of organization, it's really just stack it up and back it up. And then on top of that, we have these tags that Lightroom allow us to use. Some of them are like the, the date tag that your camera puts on the pictures. Everybody's got their clock right in their camera, correct? Um, one of those important things to do is make sure you have your camera's clock right. I didn't one session, and I have a bunch of photos from 2000. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it can, it's, Lightroom does allow you to fix it, but it's kind of a mess. Yeah. Um, and then 
I think for most photographers, location is a really important tag. And, you know, most people tend to think about their pictures according to the location that they shot it in. You know, it's, uh, I think our brains are really wired that way, that, that location is really important. And then event, um, this would be like a shoot name or, or an event that's just, you know, really an event. And then the ratings, how, how good we think the pictures are. And then finally some keywords that are kind of a free-form way to organize your pictures according to, you know, whatever's um, important to you. And then on top of that is uh, a project layer. But let's, let's see how we can filter using date. You know, Lightroom, using the filter bar, lets us hide everything except just pictures from 2013 or just pictures from 2012. Or we could filter by location and say, show me only pictures from California. Or let me see everything, or let me see only pictures from Florida. And th these filter tools are really powerful in Lightroom. We'll talk about where to find those. An event, that's usually a keyword, and that lets us also get down to just a set of pictures. And you notice that everything in the storage layer is essentially just staying there. What we're doing is we're hiding the ones we don't want to see and showing the ones we do want to see. And rating lets you filter down by just how good you think the picture is. And of course you can combine these so you can say, uh, or sorry, we have keywords too, uh, and then you can use ratings in combination like uh, the best pictures from an event. So let's see how that works in terms of collections for like a commercial job. And so let's say I have a portrait shoot and I'm going to filter by the keyword for the portrait shoot. That's going to take me down to just those pictures. And then I'm going to put those all into a collection. And I'm going to suggest that really collections are the, the central organizing tool for your library. And this is really how Lightroom has been designed. And I'm pretty sure that moving on into the future, it's going to be even more um, centralized around collections. So, so we could make a collection inside our collection set for all the pictures, and then use the filter and just bring the two stars over into another collection to proof out to the client, and make even one more collection of just the the client select. And then all of those can live inside the, the collection set and so we can hide it when we don't need to see it. And we can remove the filter, we see everything again. And let's talk about a portfolio. If I'm building a portfolio, I'm going to start with by, rate, by filtering down to just the best pictures and then let's bring those all into a group and then do our selection and our sequencing and maybe come up with another collection that's the final. And then one of the really cool things about Lightroom is that you have the ability to make additional collections on, on top of that. And um, so if you've edited down to the best pictures of, you know, my best portraits or the best pictures of Josie, you can then use that same set of pictures again and again in different combinations and, and make these creations out of them. And so that that's the three layers of organization and let me show you where we find those in Lightroom. So that's interesting that you say the collections in your mind is the basic um, the, the, the basic place to organize everything. I hadn't really thought of it that way but I guess I do it now that you say that. <laughs> well so so collections, I really think, are the, the top level. I really do think of it not as, so the base, I think, is, is just like the folders where you put your pictures, you know. Looking here in the folders panel, here's, this is an organization that I think a lot of people um, should use. I think most photographers who use Lightroom ought to use something very much like this, a year folder, a month folder, and then a project folder inside that. And, you know, you can find those by clicking on any of those folders. But really, this is just about a good orderly way to, bet, to store your pictures. And let's go look at that in the Finder. 
and photo library. This, by the way, uh, these are all stunt doubles here. This is the stunt double of my real library. Um, but it looks, you know, it's just a really simple structure. When I knew it, do a new shoot, I can just take that new shoot and drop it in the month folder. And then when I need to make a backup of this, I just back up the entire photos folder onto another drive. Yeah, I, I have a question for you, Peter, because I get yeah. this a lot in, in discussing with people. Um, and I, um, I have a feeling where this will go, but I, I don't think in years and dates and, and stuff like that. So um, under this folder structure, um, to, to my mind, it might be more difficult to locate things because I think by location. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. <laughs> so, so let's let's be um, let me let me make sure to emphasize that the folder structure is not the place you should be looking for your stuff. And one of the reasons that you can tell that Lightroom expects you to look for your stuff here is because there's only one of these organizing modules that's visible in each of the different modules or you know, one of these organizing tools, and that's the collections. You can see that in library, develop, map, book, slideshow, print, and web. Good but point. But you can't see that. Good point. Yeah. So they, they did that on purpose. So the thing I like to say is that, um, you know, you could drive your car in reverse from here in Washington, D.C. to California, there's a whole lot of design decisions that were made when they put your car together that expected you'd be driving it mostly in forward gears. <laughs> and so if you can look and see the things that they've designed it to do, then you say, oh, that's what that's there for. And, and I really do, I'm, you know, as convinced as I can possibly be on from a whole different from a whole different series of reasons that collections is where they expect you to do this organization. Now, let me show you something. How many of you guys use the filter bar? Yay, yeah. Yay filter bar. Yeah. So let's take a look at the metadata filter here. Um, so now we start going into the tagging layer, right? So the the tags are most obviously over here in the keywords. But you have this wonderful set of tags that you can have in the uh, in the filter bar as well. And let's let's actually get it so we're seeing this whole seventy-five thousand image collection. And you know you can you can find it by date if that's important to you. And you can even get day of the week information if that's helpful. If I know that I was at the uh, Silver Spring Zombie Walk on the in the end of October, I can say, oh yeah, that was a Saturday. There it is. <laughs> um, so really easy to find stuff like that. And <laughs> go back to grid with a G. But this location information, if you tag your images by location, then you can find this in the filter bar as well. And I'm I'm just a huge advocate for using the location tags for this. I've because they let that. you make sense of a really large collection of images. Now, is that done through the map module, or is that done with keyword tags? Uh, it's neither. It's uh -huh. done in the location tags. Mm. And and this, this part does drive me crazy, um, Lightroom team, if you're out there listening. And, <laughs> and that they have heard me say this before. Um, the map module's location tools are kind of only half built right now, and it does not allow you to do this this really nice hierarchy but this is just a set of metadata tags and let's go into the metadata panel and let's set this to location these location tags have actually been in existence since you know like the year 2000 or maybe the year 1990 you know late 90s um, and these have been in Photoshop's file info that entire time I have, and some, I have something to admit and something to ask about. And my problem yeah. is I rush as I'm importing my photos because I want to see them and I want to get them that I don't spend the time that I need 
is there any way to make Lightroom slow you down and ask you, do you have, do you have any keywords? Do you have anything before you hit the import button? Because once I hit that import button, I go, do And I realize yeah. I haven't done every all the steps I'm supposed to do before I've imported them. Well, um, I know you can go back and do it, but I don't. Yeah, so so there's a couple of th there's two you know there's two kinds of sets of problems. There's how do you set up a system to go into the future and develop good habits and do things in a in a way that you know is a good favor for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is how do you sort out from the mess that you've made in the past. Mm -hmm. And those are <laughs> those are two different problems. Um, so one of the ways you can sort out from the mess you've made in the past is that Lightroom's location tags will show you when an image has no location information on it. And let's uh, get rid of one of these columns so we have a little more room. So you yeah. see this this has no um, location information in there. And you can select on that and see the pictures and you know there's some that I've just forgotten to tag here like these are some pictures that were shot at my house and if you've made a metadata preset like I have and I've, I've made metadata presets for some of the frequently you uh, places I go frequently like my own house I can just tag it right there and that will tag all those images Oh, this is terrific. I never thought of it. That's great. You know, that's a great thing. Now, but if you shot with your iPhone, for example, will that location information be there because the phone is GPS enabled? Yeah, so this these are all iPhone pictures. And it's uh, it actually does some pretty cool stuff. You know, you can look in here and you can say which one of these have GPS data, and it turns out all of those do. And if we go into the map module, then if it doesn't crash Lightroom. <laughs> we can actually see the pictures on the map, which is pretty cool. And it will do a pretty good guess at where those, what those location tags are, and it'll put them in there. But you can't necessarily, uh, there's, there's some bugs with this where it's just not fully implemented yet. But for your iPhone pictures, you know, it's make sure that you have reverse geocoding enabled. In uh, is that catalog settings or preferences? I think it's I think it's by catalog. Yeah, reverse geocoding. So what this does is this lets Lightroom guess at the place name and actually put that place name here in the location fields. So for your iPhone pictures, you're actually that's actually pretty easy. It's the it's the other. 73,000 <laughs> photographs that well, are a little harder. Well, that's worth it of itself because you know, my, my Canon 6D does have GPS on it, and, I, and I, I often don't turn that on because if I forget to turn it off, it'll drain the battery. But uh, Yeah, you know, I, you know I think that the GPS thing is, is one of those things that's almost there. And you know, one of the problems with GPS in cameras is that it's not very precise. And what about the, uh, the phones are much better. What about the 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 ones from Canon directly, the four hundred dollar or three hundred dollar add-on GPSs? Have you heard about so, those? So okay, so here's the thing: the reason that your phone can do such a good job is because it's not just relying on the GPS chip. It actually has three levels of um, location uh, locate positioning that it uses. One is the GPS chip. That's the same thing that's like in a handheld GPS, and that's what's in the, most of the add-on devices. But the other thing your phone does is it uses an international database of Wi-Fi signals that um, can tell it where it is, even in a location where it can't get a GPS chip, like you know, inside a tall building in New York City. There's there's actually a gigantic database. Of it's kind of like a Google Map, but of of Wi-Fi addresses for the entire world, and and then the third thing your phone uses is triangulation of cell phone towers. So your phone knows your location a whole lot better than anything that isn't a phone can ever do. Okay, well that makes sense. <laughs> and um, but but really soon, you know, it should be it should be 
not that hard for your phone to be able to talk to your camera. That should be easier than having a little add-on device. So, Peter, to go back, you were we kind of got off the track a little bit. I know. <laughs> what, and this, I'm very into geekiness. <laughs> yeah, what's your big picture reason for talking about location? So that's the way I find I frequently look for pictures by location. And I, you know, will dive down through here and I say, oh, I'm looking for something that I shot at my house so I can go down into United States, into Maryland, into Kensington, and into 3301 Oberon Street. And I've got all the pictures from my house tagged with that location tag, including this time giant time-lapse sequence. Um, but, but that really helps me understand my collection. So this, these tags that help me filter the pictures, you know, I've, I've filtered from 75,000 down to 4,500 with just a click. And going through and adding this information by means of a metadata preset is actually pretty easy. And the other thing you can do is just put big groups on here, you know. So I have these pictures from Mozambique, but really I only have like, you know, two two real tags. This um, I don't even know how to say it, Maracuni or Maputo. And and that's all I need. I don't need real individual location tags in here. I've divided them up into you know one location, Southern Sun, but but most everything else just needs this one city tag, and this is useful to me for the rest of my life. It also tells me where I've been. So here's a here's a kind of a neat trick. If you can't remember when you went somewhere, you know, oh, I know I went to South Africa, but I wasn't sure which years I went there. Well, was it 2013? When you select on this, this filters down here to only those ones that are part of that year. Cool. And so I can see, oh, well, I went in 2012, and then I was in 2011, and not 2010. So, so these, these tags, I think, are, are really, really valuable. And unless you shoot all your pictures in the same place, I think people ought to tag with location. And you can start really generally. You know, you could start, if most of your pictures were shot in, you know, San Francisco, California, you can go tag most of them as San Francisco. And then if you know you've also been to, you know, Portland and, and uh, you know, Dallas and Boston, you can make those tags. And with even just a couple hours' work, you could tag even a very large library down to, you know, at least the city in most cases. You know, the thing that's nice is they all line up in order when you look at everything in Lightroom. So you're, you're kind of tagging big groups of pictures. It's a little hard to see here with, with this real estate like this, but, but if I have, you know, all of these pictures were shot in the same place, I can start in the first one and go down to the, the last one in that group that many all shot in the same place. So in that case, that's well, 100 pictures that can tag real quickly. So we want to do that. And then the other thing I'm going to suggest is that you do some word, some working with keywords, and you, you set this up in kind of a hierarchy. And, and so not everybody knows that you can just make a keyword and drag it into another one. So if I were... Let's say I had a, a keyword, um, the Rolling Stones, right? And, well, now it's just sitting out there, but really that belongs in concerts. So I can just take that and drag it into concert, and now that's in there. Well, this is obviously not a picture of the Rolling Stones, but, um, but what I've done is I've created this top-level keyword called events, and then when I photograph an event, like a concert, I just put it inside here, and then it's easy for me to find that keyword. And when I do multiple concerts of the same band, I can see those pictures and even note which, you know, which shoots were at which venues. 
and this you just kind of build this up naturally as you you know if all you had was three concerts or three events if it was only three events you'd have three events just three items inside events but then as that gets more crowded then you can subdivide it further make sense it does and you know but I feel sort of two ways about subdividing. I love it because I'm logical and it seems very logical. But you know what happens, I'm sure you've run into this, I'm constantly moving photos back and forth between you know my sub catalogs and all the stuff I have to go teach, I don't want to take everything and wow. I end up like I get the Rolling Stones back in the main part of the keyword list and I try to drag it into concert and it won't go because there already is a Rolling Stones keyword in there. Now that sounds like a no big deal, but when you have a lot of them to put into the, you know, to drag around and it keeps happening, it's really annoying. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> I, well, I do. Um, so the first suggestion is uh, don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't, uh, don't, people should be using as few catalogs as possible. Now, that, now we all know that's when you're doing teaching, you know, that's, that's not possible. Um, but for most Lightroom users, the fewest catalogs and the ideal number of catalogs is one. If you can, if you can make it work for you, you know, I'm. This is a catalog with seventy-five thousand pictures on it, and it's not really even breathing hard on this computer. It's not slowing down. Um, I'm up I have another eighty-four, and I'm doing just fine. I I've got another one with you know four hundred and something thousand, and it actually is pretty slow to open and close. But if you can get by with just one, that's great. Now if you can't, if you need more than just one, one of the things you can do is actually export your keywords as a list. And let's just export that as a keyword list onto the desktop. And then what that creates is this text file that's going to be pretty ugly, but it has all my keywords in it. And if you needed to make a new catalog, you can make a new catalog and import that. Let's see if we can do that really quick. Oh, I love that. Oh, yay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to put this in my, uh, let's call this test, probably est, and we'll skip the backup this time, although I strongly suggest that you should always back up when you close your catalog if you've done any important work and um, we'll update that and then you can import keywords from that list go find it on the desktop grab it nice. choose it and populate your list so what you really want to do is is if if possible make one big master list and um, and then try and use that same one between multiple catalogs. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. You can't believe how much time you just saved me. But wait, there's more. I know. More Here, let's go. Uh, let me open my, my real catalog again. <clears throat> Actually, the stunt double catalog. Okay. So, um, all right, so so I think this relatively self-explanatory, you know, that you can make these. Now, one of the things is you may forget where you put stuff, and if you type in here, this will show you all the places you might have put that keyword. Wow. Now, you can see I've got a lot of legacy stuff that I did with another program way back in the day, but if you haven't been organized, you can find them this way, and, and you could consolidate. So if I say... You know, oh, these pictures actually really belong all together in this one keyword. I can just drop it there, and then I could just get rid of this by deleting it. Interesting. Command Z to undo. Um, so, so the filter, the filter in the keywords is is really handy too. But you know, I don't really go too crazy with that. I do, I do like to keyword each one of my shoots. Not you know not everything is in a shoot, but when I do a shoot, I'll I'll make a keyword for it, and and so let's look at a client I do a lot of work for, um, PBS, and I've done actually multiple campaigns for these guys, and so uh, not by the people, but rather be inspired. So these were all different shoots I did 
um, as part of this one campaign. And so I've just built this keyword list out as I've done more and more work for them. And so each one of these is, is its own shoot. And, and build this out as uh, there's an actual need to... Key, do you hmm? keyword, like, so like let's say one of those PBS shoots, um, and I saw buildings in there. Would you keyword that for buildings also, or other, you know, keywords that are generalized that would go under other things, or would you just leave it as the PBS shoot? I, I'm not a masochist. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, there's some people that will tell you that you have to have, you know, 537 keywords on every picture. Um, I tag my images by keyword for basic, you know, if there's a shoot name, if it's a client, I want to put, you know, the client and the project. But, no, I don't go through, you know, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, tire. You know, okay, does, okay. Does, unless there's some need to. But right, in so most I do, cases, I do my locations in the keywords, which is yeah. obviously not. Yeah. So I you can really do that. locations in the keywords, <clears throat> but there's there's a reason that I really like the location tags. One of them is that when you know the way this is over here is is nice because it's not junked up with all the keywords. You know, it's not a giant keyword list I'm having to navigate down into places. You know, I could have a mm -hmm. places keyword set here, right? But this is only focused on location. But the really nice thing about it is that it shows you what images don't have the tags, right? So this is showing me everything with no tags on it. So here's some images from the very start of my digital career that didn't get very much metadata on them at all. And because because of the way this thing is designed, it shows me, oh, this doesn't have any information on it. So I could take these and, and I could tag them right now. So I'm going to well, open up the metadata. That meta explains the difference. <laughs> if I open up the metadata panel and I know that these were shot in Bethesda, in Maryland, Come on, Lightroom, catch up. And tab down to USA. And now these will no longer be in that unknown location group. Let's click that well, again. Can I ask you about some something else you mentioned? Yeah. And maybe you're going to get there, so I will shut up if you are. Uh, I think you were saying before about using collections and and having things that were like projects and then within projects yeah, yeah. asked and so yes. let's, So let's, uh, let's just finish. So we see keywords, we see locations. The, only, the other thing that's really nice is something we're going to move over into the collections panel for. And let me hit the backslash key to disappear the space bar. Um, and that is rating. And this is one of the neat things that I also have in all of my catalogs, just like, you know, the standardized keyword list is some standardized smart collections. This shows me all five star and better images, all four star and better images, three star, two star, one star. And this lets me find, look through either the very best images in my collection, the ones that are, you know, uh, a level down or two levels down, and this lets me find stuff really easily. So this is another filtration thing. If you use the rating stars in a methodical way, then it, it lets you find your pictures pretty easily. But the real pinnacle of the work that you do is the work, what I call the creative collections. And so let's take a look at, at, an, at assignments. So inside this collection set, I've created one for jobs that are in progress, and in that we have PBS, and we can see that in, inside that is, is this campaign. I work on a bigger monitor usually, so we normally have a little more real estate. But So when I do a shoot, it might end up, you know, so here's, here's everything. When it comes in, I'll make this, when the shoot comes in, I make this collection right, aw right away. I just drop everything in there. 
Because remember, this is the source that is visible in each of the different modules. So if I need to click over into develop, what I really want to be using as a source is something that's in my collections panel. So if I'm saying, okay, well, these are the ones I want to proof, and or these are the client selects, and I want to, I want to make sure that I've done these properly, then having these um, called out in collections is really valuable. And the way you, you know, the way you make these is really easily. So in this case, let's say I've got all my proofs in there and I've rated them, and I'm going to say I'm only going to, I'm only going to show the two star and better images to the client. So I'm going to filter on two star and better, and that's going to take me down to just the 320 of the 400 pictures, and then I just make a new collection and call it proofs and and then I can select all of these and drop them in. And then that's what I'm going to send out to the client as a, in, in proofing form. And so I hone my selections down here. Now this is fairly straightforward. This is just, okay, here's everything from the shoot, here's the, here's the proofs, and here's the, the selects. But it gets interesting when you start putting, when you either have a really complicated shoot or you have other kinds of portfolios you want to put together. So let me show you a, a less tidy kind of place for that. So this is a common thing. People need to make a portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I did that, I started by bringing everything together that I thought might be part of this portfolio. And then I started subdividing and experimenting with different orders and sequencing of the images. And then ultimately, in the end, I came up with a particular sequencing and a particular set of images that I really liked. And then you can start to make these other creations out of them as additional collections inside here. So you see this has the little book icon. If I need to make a slideshow, I can, let's go to G for grid, select all, and now when I'm in slideshow, I have the ability to create a custom slideshow. I have everything selected. I'm going to create a slideshow. I'm going to put it inside real people. And that's going to have all those images. And they're going to have the same sequencing that they had when I select, when I brought them in. Oops. So that's if a great idea. Great idea. So, so the thing that's also extra cool about this is that these retain all their settings. So if I make a, a special title slide for this, like, you know, my portfolio, This slideshow keeps that, even if I were to make another slideshow. So, so let me just play the slideshow from the beginning. It starts, and we weren't at the beginning. Start at the beginning. If I start at the beginning and play the slideshow, it gets that title slide. Okay, but if you make a different slideshow, and let's just make a brand new one here, and call it uh, people portfolio inside real people as well, create. Now you can have a different group of settings on this, which could be a different sequencing, or it could be a different identity plate intro slide. So let's edit that intro slide and say people portfolio. And when we go back and forth between this, you see this one retains its title slide people portfolio, and this one retains the title slide my portfolio. So what, 
this is really the place where Lightroom expects you to, to do this work and, and build these collections out. And, and you think about it, every time you put some kind of a group of pictures together for some reason, you spend this effort to put it together, you spend effort to sequence it and to do your selections and maybe get your develop settings all tweaked and everything. The next time, you know, it's, it's not an unusual thing for you to want to go back and make something, either see that one exi again exactly like it is or make one that's close to it but has a variation. And if you've made it for a portfolio to send out, you, the chances of you needing a slideshow or a book or some prints or a website are pretty good. So you can make one of these module creations. There's each of the different creation modules here has their own icon and their own specific thing. And you know, when you click it, it takes you to that module where you can see those pictures. Neat. Um, you know, unfortunately, we are coming close to about an hour of um, that yeah. we've been on the air. So I want to make sure that everyone, not not completely, we have like ten minutes left, but yeah. I want to make sure everybody gets their questions answered. So, Sean, do you have anything you wanted to ask? No, are you Fine. good? Not necessarily something that I want to ask, but I always um, I always learn things whenever I listen to Peter talk about this. Um, as I mentioned, you know, at the beginning. Uh, but I think that, that the one thing to point out to people, because a lot of people have a hard time letting go of that folder structure. And the folder structure is important, of course, but it's almost just sort of a necessary thing we have to have to, you know, somewhat, you know, logically, hopefully, and with organization, store our pictures on the hard drive somewhere, or hard drives. It's not necessarily ideally suited to doing the sorts of organization that... Um, that Peter's been showing us, and that's where you know collections really shine. So you know it's important to have the folders organized, but I think that you have to sort of realize that there are better, more sophisticated ways of really navigating through your collection and getting the most out of it, as we've seen. Yeah, I think there's there's something else that's really important to point out about that point, and and you're right, Sean. That's that's like one of the hardest things for people to give up conceptually. Mm -hmm. um, but a picture is only going to be in one folder. But your best pictures are going to need to be in lots of different places. You know, you can see how many different collections this image is in. I just clicked on the little collection icon right here. And this shows me all the different collections I've put it in. And if I duplicated this thing into 15 different folders and had 15 different real versions of the picture, I'd, I'd have a giant mess on my hands <laughs> is what I'd have. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I wouldn't, so folders really, really fall down as an organizational tool for the, for the best pictures in your collection, which are really the ones you should be worried about. Yeah, it's a, it's a necessary structure just to make sure that there there's some sort of you know root level organization on the hard disk itself, but it's not necessarily or it's not at all the best way to be uh, interacting with the data uh, that is your image collection in in a real sort of dynamic and fluid way. Yeah, and there's you know the other thing we we didn't really talk about um, backup here, but the the best way to preserve your pictures and make sure you don't lose them is to put them away, leave them in the same place, leave them with the same name, and then just make a duplicate, you know, onto another drive and, and ideally onto one more drive that can be carried off-site. And if you're moving them around from folder to folder or changing names, then you introduce this real possibility of some kind of error in the backup process and ending up losing your pictures. And so, so it really, I just can't advocate strongly enough for putting your stuff away and then using these tools on top of it to, to help um, make use of the pictures. And these, and these are just incredibly flexible. Yeah, that when, leads me to, to kind of a question, Peter, for myself, because I have a bit of a strategy um, I, I, I've actually stopped using the the 
make a second copy too during import because yeah. I have a, a synchronization mirrored backup. Yes. It takes my catalog with it. And so um, for anyone that's not quite sure what that means is I have two drives separate from my main drive that my backups go to and one drive automatically makes an identical copy of everything I'm doing. So even during import, it's busy in the background moving those files onto the mirror drive. Yeah, and, and there's an important thing also that um, the that import, the copy that's made on import isn't necessarily named the same thing and oh, isn't in the same folder structure. Yeah. And yeah, so what you have there, you know, ideally you just duplicate your photo library drive onto another drive. And ideally you have that happen automatically because yeah. any drive can fail at any point and and you really want to as as much as possible just have it duplicated onto another one that's sitting in another enclosure somewhere. Yeah. That that was one of the reasons I started doing that was because I couldn't control the naming um yeah. The, uh, of my backups, and I thought if I ever have to rebuild this, it's going to be impossible. So I just started doing the mirrored backup with a synchronizing program. Right, and while we're talking about backups, up in your catalog settings, in the general tab, I think everybody ought to have this set to ask you about backups every time Lightroom exits. Yeah. And then every time you've done anything new like import new files you should be backing your catalog up it's it's only backing the the information the metadata and the develop settings it's not backing the files up but but that becomes really important to make sure that you preserve all this useful organization work in the long term I have a question um, you triggered a, a thought in my mind which is about file renaming um, I, I see, I've read what George Jardine has to say and uh, Victoria Brampton and John Beardsworth and everybody there is advocating coming up with a file naming system and being strict about it and doing it. I have found that um, when I teach beginners especially, they are so discombobulated about the whole thing that if they start changing the name of photos right out of the camera, it's just a downhill spiral you know, from there. <laughs> Well, yeah. and they get all mixed up. So I just say, you know what? Don't rename your files. Just leave them. I know the names are very useful, but just leave them for now. How do you come down on that? Um, so I believe in giving the file its permanent name at the earliest possible moment. And you can see here the file naming that I use is my name and then a six-digit date and then the typically the original four-digit number from the that the camera assigned to the picture and so this is this one is 2011 February 13th do I have to can I zoom in to make it easier to read um, so it I I think that they your images should get their name as early as possible I don't believe in putting subject matter in it because you know, so while some shoots it's really easy, around the edges it starts getting to be this impossible task of, you know, so what about my walking around camera, you know, where I shot five pictures when I was in Denver and then I, you know, shot eight more pictures at, you know, this other event. And am I really going to have to wade through and rename each one of these? So I'm a I'm a huge fan of just automatic renaming of everything Actually, on the I way in. I had a question related to that. You know that that walk around camera. When when you go to import, what's your flow on keywording those? Uh, okay, so that's a great question, and you can see here that um, those often end up in this kind of miscellaneous group, and and what I try and do is put a location tag on everything, Be, because I'm you know, okay, I've got a few pictures from walking around downtown San Francisco. There's Katrine. And um, so if I if I just tag these with San Francisco, and I don't know whether, yeah, so these have had their location tags put on them. But I, I, I keep them in this little group here to because to, uh, I know that those 
haven't been tagged right off the bat. And let's look at the filter bar and we can see, okay, I've got 500 left that need a location tag. So I'm typically not um, putting a lot of keywords. You know, I'll put an event name on these. You know, so that's like Easter dinner. If that that would be an event name that I'd want to put on that. You know, you can trace your keywords back to where you can, you know, see what keywords you've assigned by tracing the checks. Let's take a look at, at how that works. If uh, if I have an event here and oh, I'll show Maddie there. Uh, let's create a keyword there, Easter and inside. So we've added that. You can see, let's go back to grid. When I click on this picture, you see, oh, there's a keyword that's in, this has got a keyword that's inside that list. And oh, it's inside the family list. And then the one with the check mark is the one that it has. Um, but so I'm, you know, eventually I'll probably tag all of those as Easter, but it's it's not a huge high priority. It's more important for me to go through and flag the one and and use the ratings to say, oh, these are the ones I like, and and then I can look for family and um, a high rating, and and that's a much more useful set of tags for me. Is this is a good picture, and it's about family, yeah. and you can use uh, smart have... filters to or smart collections to. I, I have one. Sorry, don't mean to. I was just trying to jump in there. I have one question from Gary, and and this this kind of opens up. It would be awesome, and I'm sure Jan's going to ask you to be available for another show at some point in the future because we've just touched the surface of some real power behind Lightroom, and we haven't even talked about published services. Um, the question yeah. was. How do you or do you keep track of exported photos, example, to upload to G plus or have printed? My personal answer to that is I use export services quite extensively. What, what's Absolutely. your take? Um, so that's this is all part of my new book. There's seven hours of video instruction <laughs> on on this, and yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I talk about in the book is how I use a label to indicate which images have been part of um, published services and I think published services are just incredible and and published service in connection with Dropbox is really cool too because you know if you you can put this in a Dropbox folder and let's uh, go to the published folder and then you know with with just a click um, I guess I'm not signed in the Dropbox right now but but if I was with just a right click I could share this with whomever I wish yeah. and and it's a really just a wonderful way to to share your photos out. I've also been using this service called Photo Shelter, which does an amazing job of of letting you upload pictures and and then let people um, you know share them with people. Either you can share just views or downloads, and and it has a lot of control on yeah, it. But yeah, this this really is like really that. important. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Um, like I say, that that's practically a whole show in and of itself, just to talk about how to efficiently use published services. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I was. Um, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So I just, you know, I did, I did a Lynda.com course on it, and unfortunately, the course didn't get named published services. But if anybody is interested in learning about as much as I know about them, there's a course called something like a uh, sharing your photos online in Lightroom, and basically it's about published services. Okay. And there was a ton. You know, every time I do a course, I research these topics to death. There is a ton to know about that. And just one reminder about that is that early on, David Marks was on our show. Uh, maybe, I don't know, six, eight months ago, and he went through how to use the Google Plus published service that Jeffrey Friedel um, lets everybody have for free from his website so that you can publish directly from Lightroom to Google Plus, and it's so useful. I just love it. Yeah. So, yeah. And but I also want to say uh, uh, something about um, Peter's, he says my new book, but Peter, I want to make sure that people know about that book. So can you talk about that and where they can get it and all of that? Sure, absolutely. This this is actually uh, a spread from the new book, and it just happened to be <laughs> tuned to uh, using published services. 
And the way the book works is that I explain stuff in text, very much like the books that I've always written, and then each of these is a clickable movie that then plays and describes the subject matter. And so it's uh, seven hours of video uh, curriculum in addition to a 200-page book on, on really everything that I've been talking about in terms of organizing your pictures in, in Lightroom. And you can find those at uh, thedambook.com. And that's not a curse word. It's digital asset management. I just have to interrupt and say what a great format for a book. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I, I pioneered this, or pioneered, I started doing it um, under a grant from the U.S. Library of Congress on a site called DP Best Flow. And that's a totally free um, uh, site that was sponsored by ASMP and the U.S. Library of Congress that has a ton of information. And we, we um, combined photos and, or, you know, text and video. And then I later was commissioned by um, World Press Photo to build one for photographers in the developing world. And we used the same um, tools to build that. And so there's an entire Lightroom workflow here, but it's based on Lightroom 3. And it has the same kind of format of text and then clickable videos. You and know, I actually was one, um, I don't know if you can see who bought your books, but a few months ago I bought another book that you published that was in the similar format. I, I may get the name wrong. What is it called? Multiple Catalog Workflow? Multi Catalog Workflow with Lightroom 5. Unbelievably great book. And I love that format because I do like listening to the movies, but I also love having the written text, depending where I'm doing, where I am. Like today I was in the doctor's office and there was no, um, you know, internet connection, so I just started reading the the PDF, and, and then I could go home and listen to the movies. Great. Yeah, and I, th I really like the idea that you can focus people's attention on what's important, and some people will just get that particular subject and not even need to see the movie, but more importantly, they can come back to the subject after they've seen the movie, and I try and always put the most important stuff to remember about it in text form so that you don't have to watch a 10-minute movie or three-minute movie to, to remind yourself what the steps are so that you can, you know, you see it, you see it once and then once you've seen it, you, you need that to jog your memory but you don't necessarily need uh, uh, to watch the whole movie again. Terrific. Now, if people want that book or any other book, again, what is the website that they go to? It is www thedambook.com and that's D-A-M and when you go into the damn book there's the damn bookshop and you can buy uh, my original book, the damn book that's getting a few years old at this point or these two brand new multimedia books which I'm really excited about um, particularly the one I released yesterday organizing your photos with Lightroom 5 I'm really excited to see that book. Um, you know, I love the general principles, like the ones you showed us today, but I think a lot of people, like me, also want specific suggestions. You know, if you are going to use some collections, here are some collections you may want to try out, or here's a, you know, a way to organize your collections, that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and that's really the thing I believe in more than anything in, in this book, and the, the thing that I was working on was let me tell you what I think you ought to do, not here's, here's the collections and here's all the different, you know, here's every button and bell and whistle, but rather this is a targeted way of understanding organization and making the most of your pictures, but also preserving the pictures, you know, because that you, you can't do one without the other. If you, you know, if you don't store your pictures in a way lets them survive, then it doesn't really matter how well organized they are if you lose all the pictures. So, so I try and just put that all together in a very guided workflow without, without a lot of options, but, but teaching you how 
to use those tools flexibly in pursuit of you know whatever your content objectives are. Got it. And so you don't publish your books anymore. You used to publish through O'Reilly, right? Yeah, and O'Reilly was was really wonderful um, in that when it came time that that uh, they no longer had a division that specialized in this stuff, they they were um, willing to let me move the book forward into the future on my own, and and so I'm you know I'm hoping that's going to end up working well. It, so far it seems to be working pretty well and and I'm, I'm really happy to do it because I can spend more time on it and I can really focus on the content creation of the business. It, it used to be that you know book was important but if in the traditional publishing arrangement I just didn't, I couldn't have afforded to write another one unless it, you know, unless we were in this kind of revenue model where I get, where I'm the publisher, and I, I think that works in a lot of areas of photography and any kind of content creation these days. The more you can kind of be the publisher, the better. I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities for photographers who understand that. You know, who can who can. Yeah, it's changing. It's definitely changing, and yeah. I'm very excited you're doing this. And I'm going to be one of the first ones. <laughs> To purchase the uh, organizing your photos with Lightroom book, I think that's a very that's a great addition to the other t wonderful books that you have there. So everybody well, else should thanks. do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pull out a screen share here. Okay. Um, yeah, this is this has been wonderful. It's really fun, and you know, I hope that um, uh, that. A lot of people came and watched you live today, um, but if you have friends who may not have seen this, if you are watching now, um, I want to remind you that anybody can rewatch this show on YouTube, and you just go to the photo. Well, I'll let Ron tell you how to find it on YouTube, so you can tell your friends um, to go there to watch this show because it really is invaluable. So, Ron, how can people find it on YouTube? The easiest way to find it on YouTube is go to the Photoshop Show page on Google Plus. And when you're on there, there will be some choices, profile and things. There's also a little link for YouTube. If you click that, the show will appear right there on our Photoshop show page on Google+. Otherwise, you can just go to YouTube and type in The Photoshop Show. Find us there, and just uh, it'll be the most recent show. OK. So does anybody have anything else they want to talk about, tell people about, anything? Yeah, what we were just, we we're actually, we we're just kind of uh, doing a little bit of typing in the background here. You guys who are watching the show haven't, don't know that. But what we're going to do is, is we just want you to do something for us, and you're going to have a, a, an opportunity to get uh, one copy of, of this new book that, uh, that Peter has coming out. And um, I can't remember the exact name of it. I have to look back in the chat. What was the exact name of it, Peter? Well, the short name is Organizing Your Photos. Okay, it's organizing your photos, and it has to do with Lightroom 5, but I'm sure it, it applies to other Lightrooms. And you're going to be able to have a chance to get that by a random draw by going to the Photoshop Show page. Don't forget to follow us. And just make a comment and tell us that you heard the word location. And we're going to take those names, put them into a randomizer, and pick one. And we're going to let you know. Only write location. Don't write anything else. Yeah, you don't have to write anything. Word location, write location. On, on this event on this event on the Photoshop Show page. Thank you, you guys. So let's go over that again. Go to the Photoshop Show page, choose this event, write the word location on this event. And then tomorrow we're going to put the, the, the post or the, the comments into a randomizer and we're going to notify you right on the page. You have 24 hours from now. Right now. Now. No, I mean now. <laughs> well, now, or then? <laughs> now, okay. Well, that'll be it. that's a really great opportunity. So everybody, go and do that. And I want to thank our wonderful guest Peter Crow. And plus, I'm so glad I got to meet you. Um, you know, I, I've known of you for so long, and we've I've seen what you've written and posted in various forums, um, but I've never actually gotten to talk to you. So it's really been fun. Really and happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. And thank you to Sean Duggan. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it as always. Thanks, Erica Thornis and Dave Bell, Ron Clifford. And um, I'd like the, you guys to stick around even after we cut off, if yeah. you would, for a moment. Sure.
Thank well, you, great. everyone. I'm the guy with the button that says stop, so I have the last word. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>